Welcome back to the afternoon session. It's great to see uh, a full audience still. Um, I'd like to welcome the Vice Chancellor up, who is going to welcome our keynote speaker. So. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to uh, detain you for very long from the uh, main event uh, th this uh, lunchtime. But I have to say a big thank you to all the speakers who've been involved in the program so far and what looks a very rich program going on through the afternoon. My only apologies are in advance that I can't stay for uh, much of the afternoon. But the really important thing from my perspective is how we're beginning to be able to get this network to come together. It really has been a huge challenge, and my congratulations to Carol and to all of the others who've been involved in this, because it really pushes this nature of public health as an interdisciplinary venture, as something that at its very heart is always something that's going to involve every discipline you could possibly imagine. I came to recognize the importance of a public health dimension both very early in uh, my training, because I had the privilege of working for a, a period of time with Archie Cochran um, in Cardiff and that's a bit like sort of talking to the god of uh, uh, effectiveness and efficiency but it was quite challenging as a student to be able to keep pace with him on some of the major dimensions that he was working on at that time very much on pneumoconiosis but it became very clear that to make an impact in any of his studies he had to engage policymakers, had to engage industries in his case, had to engage the unions and government uh, to, in order that all of the work that was being done would actually have an impact in due course. And then the last example of his life was, of course, the recognition that much of what he showed was actually not the case, and to have the courage to be able to disclose that. And here in Cambridge, I'm delighted that so many of you are engaged in similar studies are looking at the conflicting evidence in relationship to cardiovascular risks, as I could see from outside. How do you begin to get interventions to work in early years so this will impact on conditions much later in life? How do we work in schools? How do we actually work with others to be able to draw the main benefits that we can see from basic and other scientific approaches? So thank you to each and every one of you for participating in this meeting. Thank you for all that you do in the area of public health. And thank you for ensuring that you can work together to more than double and extract yet more value out of your own individual efforts. So this topic of multidisciplinarity is a great way to be able to focus on, um, on our speaker, uh, Dayman Johnson, today. I've known Anne for probably more years than both she or, or I can uh, uh, usefully reflect on. But the very fact is great to welcome her back here to Cambridge. She is an outstanding figure who I first met in the context of HIV infection and her outstanding work in relationship to HIV, but then broadening that into the wider scope of uh, lifestyles and how the interventions uh, there occur from her original work in, in respiratory ailments and elsewhere, and in bringing all that together to try to establish the importance of, of public health, and now working on a project to try to look at the health of the public in 2040, the working groups project, the Academy of Medical Sciences trying to put together. I have to say, Anne, I do hope I'm still around in 2040 to look at the benefits and to see whether you were right or wrong. But in the interim, I, can I welcome you up to tell us about uh, this pub Health of the Public 2040 projects. Thank you very much, Eddie, for being here. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's really lovely to be here. Um, I did graduate at this university some more years than I've known Boris ago. <laughs> and um, uh, and uh, it's really nice to be here. I actually, last time I came here was in the 1970s. I think they offered me a place here, actually, in this college, but I went to another one. And um, it's, really, it's, it's really lovely to be, to be here. Um, I'm going to talk today about this project which has been set up by the Academy of Medical Sciences with the express purpose of trying to get us away from thinking about 
all the problems we may have today and think more about all the problems that we may have tomorrow and, and think about particularly what kind of research base we need to have to meet some of those challenges. And I'm particularly pleased that, to be talking about this here. And this is an unashamed advert for the whole thing because most of all I'd like you to input, the whole public health community, to input into this project if it's going to be of practical use in the long run. And um, it's, very, it's very good to be here because I know that one of the hallmarks of the Institute at Cambridge has been both to bring disciplines together and to bring uh, researchers together with practitioners. And I did actually just test the audience to see how many practitioners were here and very pleased that there are indeed local practitioners, people from Public Health England, and the local authorities and so on. Um, so uh, we, the aims of the project, which I have been asked to chair, is to identify the main health challenges that we might face by 2040 and the opportunities to address them. And in doing that, we're trying to think about what we would like 2040 to look like, idealistic as that might be with respect to population health. And underpinning that idea of having some vision of where we'd like to be going to, to then put together some thinking about the kind of multidisciplinary research which has already been referred to that uh, underpins interventions to improve the health of the public, ensure that at that point there will be a, the right kind of skilled research workforce, uh, and not just within the traditional disciplines of, um, pub of what we think of as public health. And then strong links between evidence, policy development, and service delivery. So when they asked me to do that, I thought, well, no pressure then. You know? so, so I'm now relying on everybody to, to help in this mission. Um, here's the working group members, and you will see uh, many people I'm sure that you know on that list. It includes Carol Brain uh, here in Cambridge and also Teresa Marteau. I think also if you look down that list, you'll see that, it, that many of the people do not come from a traditional public health background. They come from economics, they come from the environment, they come from um, uh, science and the arts. And that's the whole idea of bringing disciplines together to think outside of the box. Uh, when we first announced this was going to happen and there was a press release, Richard Horton wrote this in The Lancet, that public health needs a rena renaissance. As the world moves into an era of sustainable development, UK public health shouldn't miss this opportunity to rewrite the contract between health and society. And I think this is a recurrent theme in some of the uh, ideas that have been presented to us. Now, um, all the time that I've been in public health, um, there's always been a discussion about where it's going. Um, I think that's has its sometimes we seen two steps forward and one step backwards. But actually, I think it's all it is actually really worthwhile thinking about how things moved on. You've heard about Archie Cochrane, for example, um, and the contribution he made to evidence-based medicine. Um, but we can think back a little bit further and um, uh, about the phases of public health. And currently, there are a number of, of commentators talking about a fifth wave in public health, um, and there have been two articles there, the first by Hanlon, and more recently one from the Chief Medical Officer, Sally Davis, uh, developing those ideas. And then Tim Lang and Jeff Rayner's work on ecological public health, uh, where they, set, they talk, again, about the importance of pulling together material, biological, social, and cultural aspects of public health as being the way forward for the 21st century. Well, what does that really mean? Well, just to remind you, in case you're not familiar with this literature, about this is a great generalization about the waves of public health. And I don't think you should think of one happening and stopping. They are actually uh, multiplicative, and one has built on the other. We now take clean water and sanitation, which was started in the 19th century, for granted. But many parts of the world do not yet have access to that luxury. Um, the second wave was of scientific rationalism, medicine and engineering up to the 1950s. Then, of course, the emergence of the NHS and the welfare state in the 1940s through to the 80s. And then perhaps the time that we are more, um, more familiar with in the 1960s onwards, the things we are mainly concerned with now, and we've already heard about the, the the legacy of Archie Cochrane, developing healthcare interventions, the randomized trial being extended to um, public health interventions, the study of risk factors and lifestyle, and the emerging concerns with health inequalities. So what is this new wave of public health? 
Well, think, first of all, uh, in, in the last <laughs> phase, what we've achieved. I think sometimes there's far too much ha hand-wringing about whether or not we can produce the evidence. I mean, it is extraordinary, the decline in cardiovascular disease mortality in most of the developed world. Now, it's easy for us to attribute all that, as I often hear it attributed to biomedical interventions. Of course, most, a lot of the decline occurred before um, those biomedical interventions uh, emerged, and they're related, of course, to smoking and other factors. And many of you here work in that area and could give me the precise attributable fraction, I'm sure. Biomedical interventions such as vaccines and so on have been a very important part of that, this era and indeed will continue to be so. But when we think forward into the fifth wave of public health, I think we're beginning to see public health embedded in, in some very um, uh, other very big challenges, and they are largely global challenges. The UN Sustainable <coughs> Development Goals are now in draft. Instead of five Millennium Development Goals, there are 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and the, if you can all remember them all, um, I'm sure Carol will offer you a prize. But broadly speaking, you know, they are about the eradication of poverty and the development of a sustainable planet. Next month, the Lancet Commission on Climate Change and Health will public, publish, and I think shortly afterwards, or possibly at the beginning of, I'm not quite sure when it's due to be, um, the Commission will publish, the Commission on Planetary Health, chaired, I think, by Andy Haynes. And none of you could avoid the recent concerns about global health security, be that in relation to the Ebola outbreak or indeed other threats um, uh, related to human security. So I think all this sets public health in a much broader context, and that's been a very large part of the evidence that has come to us. So what might this next wave look like? Well, I pulled out some themes from those three papers I showed you. And of course, a lot of it at the heart of it is reducing health inequalities. And the question then is how? Because you all know that we've done very well on improving our life expectancies, but we haven't diminished health overall. We haven't diminished health inequalities. And I think at the heart of this is something about what has been called a health-promoting societal context produced by a collaborative effort involving a wide range of stakeholders. Um, and I think there, what does all that mean? Some of it is about maximizing the value of health and recognizing that if we're going to judge a successful society, health ha should be at the core of that, not just economic, just not economic measures. Of, uh, of, uh, of a healthy society. And that means, of course, building uh, public health in all policies across government and regarding health as a common good which is valued in a society. And uh, the, the original paper on, on, um, on, uh, on developing this fifth wave talked about moving from an anti-view, a view of, of, of an unhealthy society, to a view of a pro-health, a pro-health society. In my own field of sexual health, talking about for example, moving away from uh, the adverse consequences of, 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 of sexual lifestyle for STIs, unwanted pregnancy, to one where we kind of value a healthy sexual lifestyle as opposed to just the negative effects. And that also, I think, changes the relationship, for example, between professionals in the field to um, one of rather than dominion or power over individuals to one of cooperation and independence. And I'm, I'm very fascinated by how the whole uh, information revolution is going to change the power structure in clinical interactions in medicine, where patients or people basically have access to information which was before they could never uh, they could never reach. And our role in medicine, I am clinically qualified, may be more in interpretation rather than uh, the handing down of um, of information. So in public health, you're very familiar. There are lots of pictures that look like this. Uh, we are concerned. Um, not just with, uh, even if we move, generally, when, it, when you look at investment in research, a lot of it is at the discovery end of science and less and less uh, seems to push through first into translation to clinical practice, but really to what we're trying to achieve, which is translation to real world settings, where sometimes the, some of the traditional methods we're familiar with are really very difficult to use. We have to use them at certain settings, uh, in certain settings, and they're very val valuable, cluster randomized control trials and so on. But actually evaluating public health interventions often acquire, requires the application of new methodologies where in the, in the face of um, natural experiments, and indeed, particularly now, where we, we really need to grasp um, uh, the huge opportunities from big data 
to, uh, to look not just at the, uh, how they can be used for personalised medicine, which is a lot of the focus nowadays, but how they can be used to understand both intelligence in populations, to understand emerging problems and conditions, but also to both act and to, and to and evaluate those interventions. So our project then, what's it trying to, to achieve? It will consider um, how to capitalise on advances in all areas of science and technology relevant to public health and attempt to bring together the range of disciplines. Ensure that we promote the adequate interface between researchers, policy makers and practitioners. So we've been asking what are the main challenges? What are the research and research infrastructure requirements we need? What are the training requirements? And I would push that right back with the Vice Chancellor in the room um, to uh, undergraduate training. How do we put, for example, an understanding of a population perspective into, into the training of people in healthcare and in medicine? And how can we ensure that public policy and practice is informed by evidence? Just on the technology front, can you all hear me? Because I'm aware I haven't put my roaming microphone. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah, OK. Um, so what's in and what's out of this project? It's a chance for us to develop new thinking in the area. We have got a UK focus, but as the people who have given us evidence so far have said, we cannot possibly just limit to ourselves to that because of the international influence on the UK experience. We're trying to think about the disciplines that, not, that need to be brought in that aren't yet present, so I think particularly of computer science, um, law and ethics, uh, and um, uh, economics that need to be brought more closely into engagement with people studying the health of the public. And we've been using horizon scanning techniques and we've been engaging with the public. What we're not doing, however, is producing recommendations about specific interventions like alcohol and uh, uh, alcohol use, for example, and we're not trying to assess the strengths and weaknesses of the current UK public health system, which has changed actually quite dramatically in the last few years. So the approach that's being used by the Academy is to envision on the right hand the possible futures, to think about what aspirations we might have in an ideal world for the health of the public in 2040, and start to think and take from that the health of the public in 2015. Uh, where are we? Where, where, where would we like to be by 2040? And we asked um, a group of stakeholders and you as a respondents to our call for evidence to think about the wider external forces. And there, there I am thinking about the big issues like the global economy, uh, environmental and climate change. And then moving into the center of that, um, that, that, that's, that uh, circle, technological change, and then UK politics, economics, and health systems in order to focus on the research evidence capacity, infrastructure, and translation, which we need to plan for now. Because the undergraduates who are coming through this university today are the leaders of 2040. And unless they're skilled to address the kind of questions that concern the health of the public, that's the trick that we'll be missing. Um, and that's what we are trying to address. When we ask people about, I've forgotten what you call these things. I, it's not a word salad, is it? That's something. <laughs> but, uh, sorry? A cloud, that's the thing, yes, okay. Um, so, <laughs> a word salad is something quite different, but um, there we are. Uh, the, 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 these are the kind of words that when we ask people about drivers of change, and you see issues of um, uh, the technical issues like uh, genomics and, and uh, those things. We see a lot about the environment, transport, um, healthcare looms large, technology, and in there, inequality uh, uh, features largely, as does informatics. These are some of the key things that people are, are uh, of course, writing to us about. And um, the sort of things that we have been concerned with, of course, are climate and environmental change. Um, I know there are those of you in the room who are very interested in this area the continuing um, uh, uh, emissions, carbon emissions, as continuing growth of uh, a rise in global temperature and the concerns that we will not be able to decarbonize fast enough to uh, avoid a, a, a disastrous trajectory uh, in the coming uh, century. And at 2040, those impacts will most certainly already be felt. We know that we are going to see massive demographic change globally and increasingly in the UK. People will live in cities. Energy consumption uh, on current trajectories will increase, particularly in non-OECD countries, 
good to hear the apparent projections for China this morning being a little better. We know, partly as a result of the huge benefits of public health interventions, that people are living longer, but the population, of course, is growing, and our trajectories for the elderly population in this country uh, will continue to increase out to 2040. This, um, uh, which was a couple of, uh, a couple of um, photographs in, in Nature, from uh, an article by Abdullah Dar uh, uh, addressing the grand challenge of chronic non-communicable diseases, tells us a lot of the things that we're facing uh, going out to 2040, um, uh, uh, kind of worn out by the communications revolution, stressed out, smoking, uh, a lot of fat in our diet, obesity, um, uh, not moving, no, etc. These really are some of the major challenges we face globally. And this was the challenge which he put out in, in 2007. But I think the pro progression is inexorably in this direction for the coming years. This we'll see also in Britain, with here on the left the projections of the number of people um, who will be uh, obese in the, uh, the growing levels of obesity, and on the right the growing projections of numbers of people with dementia who will have, of course, uh, uh, needs which um, will fall particularly towards their end, of the, their end of their lives. And I think it's striking the estimates have been made of how what a large fraction of our healthcare costs fall on the last two or three weeks of our lives. Um, and uh, Carol, this is your area, but um, one is left with something we've discussed a lot in the group, is that we really haven't figured out how to make um, uh, the end of life a better experience, both uh, socially and medically, and to reduce the associated healthcare costs. Global health security is very much in the, um, in the news, and it seems that really we have some real challenges for our global institutions in order to be able to respond to such, uh, to, to such outbreaks as Ebola and other, um, and other uh, threats to our security. <coughs> Antimicrobial resistance, these are the results from the O'Neill review last year. Um, the estimate that we'll have, that's, I think that's 10 trillion, but projected loss to global, somebody, somebody, there's plenty of statisticians in the audience, projected loss to the global D GDP from AMR by 2050, and 10 million deaths per year by 2050 if we don't manage to secure um, either, well, both better guard, uh, uh, better care of our antimicrobial stocks and, no, uh, and novel solutions for the future. And then there are the opportunities, and the one people mention most are the opportunities we have for digital health and social care, and the need to harness um, the, the, uh, the opportunities that um, uh, the information revolution provides us for. But the thing that is, looks like it may be tripping us up is the whole issue of governance and access to data and how we manage that and harness that for this vision of, uh, of um, uh, health, in, it, health as, a, as a common good will rely enormously on better understanding of where we stand, um, where, the, where the new threats arise, and understanding the health of populations. It's such an opportunity and one that we mustn't uh, mess up by issues of our inabil inability to deal uh, with governance and security. Um, I'm very struck, though, having um, been talking to a number of people about in the innovations which are coming from technology companies, that actually you can develop the technologies, but the real trick is how you actually make them function in practice. Um, we've just been developing, this is a very simple example, uh, a care pathway for people to use, a, um, I work in STI, so to use a chlamydia test at home, and then to be able to get the result electronically and have a prescription done electronically. And so the issue is not the test, it's actually all the connections in between and the care pathway and the governance around prescribing, for example, an antibiotic without actually sitting with the patient in front of you. How do you create those care pathways which will allow us to use these technologies effectively? Uh, one is also struck by the possibility that technologies may increase inequalities because there is such a divide between those who, who either have or do not have access to you know, food, water, uh, good diet, um, uh, employment, and so on. This will also apply in the field of access to information. So how do we align practice? And how do we make sure that these 
these technologies are, are applied to the health of the public as opposed to personalised medicine. I mean, genomics uh, have extraordinary promise for personalised medicine, but there are an awful lot of things which we don't need personalised medicine for in or, order to achieve uh, health gain. And we have to really align practice between both personalised medicine and population benefit. So we launched our programme in 2014 with a multidisciplinary workshop. And there we explored our vision of the future and the drivers of change, some of which I've just tried to illustrate in the last few slides. We asked you to comment on the vision, uh, you the public health community, and our drivers of change, and also having um, looked at whether you thought these were the key issues in the future for public health or the health of the public, <coughs> to then also come up with recommendations about what the key questions and organisations were for health research and how we might engage with the other disciplines which need to contribute to improving the health of the public by 2040. That call for submissions was out between March and May. Um, we are still we're very, very keen to hear from you. I know you're all really not yet had time this term. Um, summer is nigh, and I'm sure we would love to hear from you. Um, I hope not on your summer holidays, but um, when it's a little bit quieter, to have some reflective input, further reflective input to this project. We really do want to hear people's ideas. So uh, you can go on the Academy website and you'll find both the vision and the drivers there and the, the request for input into what practical, uh, what practical steps we should take in the research community to be fit for that future. We're now in the process of having verbal input from round, round table discussions to, uh, uh, to people who in, we've invited to come in and talk on the various themes relating to the, to the call. We've had a number of public di dialogue events and uh, at the end of July, we'll be having a stakeholder engagement workshop, which will bring in a combination of researchers, practitioners, and policy makers uh, to inform the next stage of our discussion. And we hope to report next year. So we hope that this report will be uh, a, a, of interest to policymakers, funders, and researchers, including particularly those at the early stage of their careers in research. And they're particularly keen to hear from those of you who are considering a research career in public health about what seem to be the challenges and the opportunities for the future. We have carried out a number of uh, public engagements events, and there was one, I don't know if anyone was, one was at the Cheltenham Festival, but there was certainly the Academy uh, Working Group was present there in, uh, in a consultation exercise with the public. I've been at some of these, um, these discussions, and of course, when you talk to people about the health of the public, they immediately think of the health service. That's usually where they begin. Once we, explain, once we talk to people about we're thinking about the broader things that determine health and the health, their health in the future, these are the things that they, uh, they're very interested in. They're interested in prevention. They're interested in, in social responsibility and the issues around uh, whether or not you have a vaccination and who, for whose benefit. They're very interested in obesity and alcohol, and to some extent, top right-hand corner, they're interested in emerging technologies. What I, we heard much less discussion about was the issue of uh, environment and the interface between, between the environment and health, the development of cities, um, and the issues around some of the co-benefits which would come from, um, from decarbonisation, for example. And then we also, on the, on the uh, you can go on the Lancet website where Richard Horton invited people to put in their reflections about the health of the future. And I tell you, there's a lot of, there's a lot of pessimists out there um, and there are a few optimists. So in the interest of balance, I'll show you some of the pessimists and the optimists, but I quite like some of these, some of them coming from our medical students around the country. So here's somebody who's very concerned about the health needs of an octogenarian, an uh, octogenarian population in the future will have selfish children and um, won't look after them. So that's one uh, depressing future we might all face. Um, here's another one where one person feels that antibiotics will be lost as a valuable resource and that we'll be thrown back in, uh, into a situation like the Middle Ages with uh, uh, basic procedures being deadly and so on. Uh, and then somebody else who on the other hand, it's very optimistic and says necessity will drive invention, invention 
and I see life finding a way. So there we are. Um, and then um, another person who really sees this issue of already raised, that technology will drive further inequalities in health um, amongst those who are wealthy. And the other one that I've also raised, which is, is the extent to which we will actually have much more access to our understanding of our health and we will participate in greater health care and a different relationship in clinical care. This seems to me an extraordinarily important issue in really how um, the public interface with health and what we see as a society in which health is, is valued more greatly, but also in how we practice medicine going forward and that we do engage in the future in a very different way um, contract in relation to lifelong care and in relation not just to, to diagnosis and treatment but actually to the prevention of disease and, the, uh, the, the, and, and, and on the one hand public health, public health issues that will relate to improving the health of the public and our individual health. On the other hand, our ability to receive personalised attention when we need it. Um, and in, in a situation where we're in a much more egalitarian uh, relationship with professionals. So, with all that in mind and with the input we've had, uh, we've, we've just been analysing in the last few weeks, we've begun to think about what is it that we're trying to achieve by 2040 and then how we put the right research base in to achieve that. And the overarching view is that the UK trend is that we would like the UK trend being towards improved physical and mental health and well-being. And I can we could discuss well-being, the use of the word, which is apparently very controversial nowadays, but we can discuss that with a narrowing of the gap between these groups with the best and worst outcomes. So at the heart of this is the issue of inequality and how to diminish it, something we have not been successful with in many environments. So we... The vision for a future society was of a population which is consistently measured and monitored and treated as a key indicator of societal success, that the natural and built environment and the social and political environment supports healthy living for all. These are, many of these are the kind of themes you'll see in the Sustainable Development Goals. That the economic and commercial environment and the knowledge and educational environment supports healthy living for all and, and um, it is, it diminishes inequalities. Um, that we, every person experiences an end to life which is, involves shared decision-making in which their views and values are considered and that every child experiences a start to life that enables them to realise their full potential. Again, a theme, I think, that was um, uh, evident in the uh, Inequalities Review. That resources are allocated more proportionally to interventions that, that best, with the best prospect of beneficially affecting the health of the, project, the public, and that national resilience has been increased in the face of shocks and disruptive events. And then lastly, and it's number 10 now that is a focus of what we, if that sets the kind of principles of where public health research uh, should, and, and activity should be directed, then we do need a health workforce and an interdisciplinary research capability equipped to understand and address the health needs of the population and to generate the evidence which is going to be needed to improve the health of the public. So the next stage really for us, and this is what I think most of all we want people's input on, because I think we can all, um, uh, we, we've had a lot of support for those kind of views of where we're trying to go, of the drivers and where public health needs, the health of the public needs to frame some of the disciplines which we need to engage with to secure that future. But then I think what we really want, if we want to see practical outcomes, is a better um, sense from you of the kind of research uh, evidence that we need to be generating. What are the new approaches we need to evaluating interventions and translation at population level? What is the kind of evidence or experiments we need to do to reduce inequalities? What are the interactions between environmental sustainability and health? Workforce and training is critical because if we want to engage with new disciplines, they not only need to be in the training programs of those who want to pursue a career in research to help the public, but we also need to draw specialists in environment, the built environment, climate change, law and ethics, to actually engage with health consequences because so, men, so often those disciplines are siloed. And that includes the funding landscape, 
because of the dis difficulties that it may, there may be for siloed funding councils to be able to work across disciplines. And that is, of course, I, I think at least part of the review that is going on at the moment uh, across research councils. Um, I know here in Cambridge you have the research infrastructure which gives you an institute of public health. What are those infrastructures we need for the future? Are they physical environments where practitioners work together with um, researchers? Or are they virtual? Um, uh, and what are the institutional uh, structures we need within universities to facilitate this discipline? Indeed, should we be pushing out into the undergraduate curriculum um, uh, 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 population health uh, uh, BSCs, for example, uh, one is currently being started. And then the translation into policy and practice means we have to grasp big data and its practical applications, for example. We need to figure out that, pra that practice interface, and we need to think about links with government which extend upon the de beyond the Department of Health, and even perhaps more difficult for all, all, uh, for all of us, the interaction with industry. We were talking about some of that in the, in the, in the lunch break. Please contact us. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and don't send me any emails because um, <laughs> I can't cope with the technology, but please send them. <laughs> but please, please send them. And if you can't cope, do send what, send an email to David Bedit at the Academy of Medical Sciences. You can still phone him up. And uh, but even if you're even really, um, really bright, you'll be able to go onto the website and you'll find there a place for you to input. I very much hope that um, the universities will continue to assemble your, your intellectual power and really help us uh, and make some of this a reality uh, for the future, not, not, not just something to collect. Could you collect dust in your computer? Um, <laughs> uh, so I think uh, we don't want this to collect dust. We want it to, to change um, how we, we create, a, uh, create a, a research workforce for the future. Thank you. very much indeed. Are there any questions or comments? So I'm going to throw a challenge to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, oh dear. Are most of the discoveries that mm. take place, mm. and this goes back to your slide on the petaflops that mm. are required, mm. now that blue dot mm. is there on that graph for mm. a very good reason, mm. because at that point silicon mm. becomes a non-viable entity mm -hmm. yep. in terms of increasing computer power. Yeah. So we're very dependent mm in public health mm. and in extrapolating from discoveries that are made for entirely different purposes. Absolutely. Mm. Let's actually be totally politically incorrect. The reason you mm. will build bigger computers is the defense industry, mm -hmm. much to most people's uh, annoyance, mm. and yet those have to be converted. So how do we couple the discoveries that will be made for other purposes to public health and that first use in the public health domain before we get on to the evaluation, which is what much of the uh, theme of, of this particular topic is uh, in expanding public health is about. So can we actually begin to start working on elements that can begin to project from other fields which have got nothing to do with public health at all? Well, I mean, I think, well, I mean, you, you, of course, this whole issue, but I, my, my physics is not good enough to know that now there is, a, there is likely to be a step change, but I can't remember the exact technology. If you'll tell me what well, it, it is. Well, it's most quantum computing. Yeah, it's quantum computing. Yeah, right. exactly. The next That's the next thing which has been worked on. And you know, I think if you were to look, I mean, the, the thing is, we do have a rather linear view of life. And actually, one of the things we did was to go back and think about the, what the achievements were over the last 50 years and the things that none of us will predict. So the whole business of predicting, um, of predicting, well, not predicting is the wrong word, thinking about futures is fraught with a huge number of, of things, because those are the things we hadn't thought of. So we thought about the things that we hadn't thought of, and of course, the thing we hadn't thought of, which you're absolutely right, came out of the defense industry, was of course the internet. Exactly. So, you know, the question is always to be looking for the thing that nobody else has thought of, which is going to change the way we, the way that um, we we move. I, I mean, I maybe this is quite wrong, but the idea that I'm incredibly struck by the way that the next generation, which by and large isn't in this room, 
uh, is communicating. It's completely different from the way that we communicated, um, at least when I was a teenager. And it, that seems to me to may fundamentally alter the, the sort of contract that we're, that we're in with society in public health. And I'm not, I don't think we have got anywhere near dealing with that. That's not answering your question with respect to what is a disruptive technology we haven't thought about. But we're often very slow in actually grasping the one that's already arrived, which I would say was information. The bit I'd like to do is to mm. make public health itself a motivation to create a disruptive technology rather yeah. than us merely being the recipients and beneficiaries. Well, I think that's because we're slow in, in realising yeah. what, what, how we can benefit from them. Any other points or comments anyone would like to make? Please. Hi, Ron Zimmern from the PhD Foundation. It seems to me that one of the biggest barriers, um, uh, I and my team worked on genomics in public health for the last 15 years, but to me the, the biggest barrier is that between those who espouse social models of disease and those who espouse biological models of disease. Mm -hmm. And these should be seen as complementary. And I find very few people who, who take that view, they are either on one side or on the other, and I wonder whether you had any ideas or how the ac academy could actually catalyze the understanding of these complementary um, ways of looking yeah. at the world. Well, I, I mean, I, I think that's absolutely critical. I mean, my own, we, we are terribly linear in our thinking, and actually this is all about interdisciplinarity and bringing a convergence of ideas, because actually there's very few things we solve by by one method. I mean, I had a vaccine example up there, but you can see how easy that's to disrupted by a social misintervention, I would say. But um, uh, in the case of measles, on the other hand, in my own field of HIV, we, we had a social model for that until we had an intervention. Actually, we've, we, the incidence of HIV is, is, is higher in gay men in, in London now than it was at the end of the 80s, because as soon as we had a biological solution, we forgot the other, the social intervention. So we, we seem quite... In, so I don't have an answer to that, but I tell you what I do worry about, is that, that, um, that we have actually to make sure these things elide, because most of the discussion, you hear discussions about, about obesity being a problem of the genes that cause obesity, and that, that just seems to me, I mean, that's, the genes are important, but actually the problem is, is a much more complicated one than a, one, uh, than, than a single fix. So I, my own view is, although I'm talking about, and this isn't necessarily the view of the working group, Although we're talking about bringing in a number of other disciplines to public health, conversely, I think we need to get closer to clinical medicine in some of these areas if you want to bring that together. And that means that the next generation of doctors have to understand this because we simply cannot afford the kind of health care that we're becoming used to. We, they have to understand where they position themselves in this spectrum, which is clinical, which is disease. And I don't think we're anywhere near that. That's a particularly clinical issue, but we do have to bring them together. I totally agree with you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Relating then to the, the difficulties of, of mm. surveying, mm. which you tackled in the 1990s, I think for the future, we actually need to survey and monitor what proportion of the population has a good death and what good death yeah. represents yeah. to people. Yeah. Yeah. And that is Technically, socially yeah. difficult yeah. to do, but I think we would learn a lot yeah. mm. about what the public wants to tell us. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we have only again. She, I totally agree with you, Sheila, and the issue of um, end of life care. Uh, we have that's another thing for medicine, actually, which is we are we still think it's all about cure. We find it incredibly difficult to care, and uh, we have to change that too. It will have a big impact on on how we deliver services and hope, and maybe even costs. So, Anne, I mm. think that I'm going to have to draw yeah. this to a yeah. close because we're very nearly at the next session. Can I just say, I think this is a brilliant initiative by the Academy mm. of Medical Sciences. Congratulations for you taking this on. I think that's quite courageous. However, Thank you. I, I think, think so too. Group, I'm looking at you, <laughs> well, there are 200 of you in this room. You're all part of a network in public health. Carol, the challenge for you is can you get 
the views of people here collated and put together as a network response to the challenges that are abstract to us. Because we won't have too many opportunities like this to enter the fray in the debate. And it's not comfortable, it's not easy, and many of you will have disparate views. But let's get them across and take the opportunity of changing something for 2040. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.